uh, sorry for being late, but um, my Mac just died, so I needed to borrow one. And Keynote was making uh, fun of me all the time, so sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, um, a little bit of introduction about me. Um, I'm Karolina, I'm from Krakow, Poland, and I work at Nojitsu. Uh, I'm a UX designer. I also organize JavaScript meetups uh, back in my hometown, Krakow. Um, and I do a bunch of other stuff, but that's the most interesting thing about me. Um, so, like, the purpose of this talk is I will tell you how to make your life easier, like personal and developer life, really fast, simple, and easy. And how you should do that? Well, you shouldn't be hanging out with these guys, really. You shouldn't be hanging out with Alex and Jonathan and Hori, I really you shouldn't be doing that because that will really affect your productivity the next day. You shouldn't be doing that. But uh, jokes aside, you, re you really should hang with them. They're really cool. Um, so uh, talking about simplicity, I think that every one of you just know what simplicity in general is. Like, what's the idea behind simplicity? So it's like freedom uh, from complexity. Uh, it's like subtracting uh, the obvious things and making things more meaningful, like adding meaning to the things you're actually doing. So um, you, are think you need to focus on the core of the things you are doing, like the core purpose of your app or website, whatever you are doing uh, on the web. Uh, you probably noticed that um, most popular and hyped designs uh, are the simple ones, like for example, 37 signals designs uh, or mint design. So um, there is this rule, you probably know it, uh, and it's called KISS, uh, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, so we can basically apply it to development, your life, whatever you can think of. Uh, it came from Johnson, an aircraft uh, engineer, and it basically means um, that the word stupid refers to how complex uh, you, you need to perform the action to fix the problem with the hardware or software you are using. So um, you should be applying this rule like when writing code. So what when can we do to like achieve like the master uh, of simplicity anyway? Uh, well, we can use frameworks. Like, I bet that most of you are using frameworks. Hands up. Who's using frameworks? Daily basis, okay. <laughs> um, what are you using? Bootstrap, for example. Anyone? Uh, HTML5 boilerplate. Foundation. Any other? Okay, so uh, you're all like familiar with the idea of a framework. You know that's a bunch of reusable code of snippets um, that you are using to make your development processes faster. So uh, either you are using a ready framework or you are writing your own boilerplate because it's all about uh, the requirements for the project you, you are working on. So uh, like frameworks were made to simplify your development lives to make the processes really efficient, fast, and simple. Uh, but wh when choosing framework, you need to think about the project you are working on, like whether you're working on a big project or a small project, whether uh, you should actually use uh, a really big, like complex framework. For example, Bootstrap is fairly big. Uh, or whether you should just write a code from scratch. Uh, there are various frameworks, um, like for example CSS specific, uh, JavaScript, PHP, these are only examples. But um, you need to remember about the difference between the framework and the library. So framework is basically like you seen on the previous photo, previous slide. Um, is only a skeleton for your project. You just build upon it. And a uh, library is, uh, mm, is um, basically, um, it lets you perform specific things, specific operations. So um, you can have all these specific um, frameworks, like CSS ones like Blueprint, Zen Framework, jQuery, Mutus. Uh, you can also have like full stack frameworks. <laughs> yeah, I really love Bootstrap. Not Ryan Gosling, though. Uh, so you can use, for example, Foundation, HTML5 boilerplate, or Bootstrap from Twitter. Um, so you have basically CSS, JavaScript, HTML, some widgets built in. So if you are a developer and you are like not kind of into designing stuff, but you want a nice website, so you will probably go with Foundation or Bootstrap. But um, please don't go with Bootstrap <laughs> because of the standing, the like 
black nav bar, it's really bad. Uh, you, you should at least customize the framework when you're using it. Uh, how many of you actually who, you, who are using Bootstrap are customizing the CSS files? Okay. Is it easy? Yeah? yeah. Really? Okay. Um, well, um, when working with frameworks, uh, you have some drawbacks and really like serious dis drawbacks and disadvantages you, you need to think of. First is like unsemantic poo. Uh, you should definitely check this article by Chris Coyer uh, if you still uh, didn't see it. Uh, basically, if you're working with frameworks, you have a bunch of divs and spans instead of like native HTML5 uh, elements, uh, which actually hold the semantic value. So you're stuck with all these like 20 divs uh, or even more, and you're just diving into this code, or even if you're working on a team, uh, someone is uh, checking out your code and he's totally lost because you forgot to comment your code and it's really a mess. So um, it depends on the framework. For example, if you use foundation, um, you have, for example, classes like 12 columns, 8 columns, which generally makes sense but it's not so semantic as HTML5 elements. So uh, how you can actually address that issue? Well, you can set, uh, use ARIA roles. Um, there will be a speech tomorrow uh, about ARIA from Ramon, so I bet that he will tell you more about ARIA. But um, for example, if you want to set um, a div with content, you would usually, if you were writing your own code, you would probably using a like div a class content. And it's really obvious and semantic because you know that's main content in there. So you can um, take this framework with, for example, class of 12 columns because that's the one you need and set the role uh, to main. And that gives you some semantic value uh, for, for, that, uh, for that tag. Another thing is, uh, is the learning process. Because no one knows these frameworks anyway. Like you need to spend time reading documentation. You need to learn how to use the framework itself. So you need to compare the time which you uh, have spent on learning the, how to use the framework actually versus the time that you will spend on writing your own framework or boilerplate. So um, it makes sense to um, use a framework uh, if you're planning to use it over time. Like for example, you went with Foundation because you think it's really cool uh, for your projects and you'll be planning to use it in the future. If you keep switching uh, frameworks all the time, uh, you'll just be basically wasting your time on, on learning stuff. I mean, it's also good if you, if you really need other frameworks. It's all uh, the matter of the spec of your project. But definitely you should like, start with reading the documents and then uh, just dive into code. This is like really important issue. I already was asking about it. Um, if you are using a framework uh, and you're like full stack framework like Bootstrap or Zorb or HTML5 Boilerplate and they have some stylings uh, embedded in them. So are you going to actually write a new style sheet with the stylings uh, and overwrite the existing rules or are you going to um, just rewrite the code uh, within the main style sheet? What are you going to do? I mean both of these approaches have uh, their disadvantages like if you uh, create new file you who have problems with specificity. Uh, you're just like adding another style sheet to load. It's really bad for optimization, and it, in general, it's, it's not a good idea. But then, if you edit the main style sheet, what happens if you want to update? Like, for example, recently Foundation uh, had a new version, like third version. So, what are you going to do when the updates come in? How go you're going to handle that if you already like modified the whole style sheet? So. Uh, you really um, need to understand the code you're dealing with. Like, for example, if you work with Bootstrap and you just don't check the documentation, you just, just take the code, don't download it from GitHub, and then use it. And then, for example, you say, OK, I don't need that stuff. I will just erase it from my style sheet. And then you're working, working. You're, for example, using labels or tabs, and something isn't working, like some styling is messed up, because you just like uh, deleted some dependency. and you didn't even notice because you didn't know the framework at all. Another thing is um, heavyweight code. I mean, these uh, frameworks are in general quite lightweight. 
but if you approach the issue of the uh, with the style sheet, uh, like if you create another style sheet to override it, then it becomes like uh, more requests for the from the browser and uh, lots of unnecessary code also. Because um, if you look at Bootstrap, you you have like really um, many UI elements, but you may not be needing all of them. But are you are you going to delete them or are you just going to leave them in your style sheet just because you probably I may have need them in the future? Like what would you do? Um, so these are like the major drawbacks of using a framework. Uh, but of course, uh, it's a like really awesome tool for a development process. Like obviously, um, it's really fast when you use a framework because you can reduce the testing phrase. Uh, you have just really ready-made code, so you can just paste it in and it's there, it's done. You don't need to write it by yourself and spend hours on just writing markup. And testing is really easy because these frameworks, uh, these projects are more, more like community driven. They're all on GitHub. They're tested by authors. They're tested by users. There are issues on GitHub. There are like questions on Stack Overflow. So you are like extra sure that they're being tested. So you, you can like reduce the time you waste on uh, testing. Like for example, uh, if you are dealing with uh, mobile optimizations, um, you would like can spend literally days on testing on mobile. It's really hard. So, um, and you probably don't have all these devices at your house, right? You just use some tools uh, available uh, on the web. Uh, so it's really good to know that you are almost confident that it, 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 it will actually work. Um, and they're also very beginner friendly because uh, if you are a beginner developer, like you have some vague idea about CSS and HTML, um, you just download the framework, you just read the manual, and then you can just dive into code. Like, there's no better way of learning than just playing around with some, something that is already done, and you can just manipulate it and check out how it's actually interacting and how it's working. So that's the thing about frameworks. Um, another thing that, that can help you simplify your uh, developer's life is code generators. Uh, Who's using like CSS free please, Colorzilla for gradients and other generators? No one? One person? Seriously? You're just like typing it all the time? Okay. There's more, but that's really not many though. Um, so basically, um, you're generating these snippets of code and then pasting them in your style sheet. So um, what's the like drawback in there? Well, uh, there's no shorthand variants often. Uh, they're like um, not optimized. They may be not the latest specification. They may have unnecessary vendor prefixes. So basically it's a major threat, but uh, beginner developers or even seasoned developers as well tend to use them. And you need to really think carefully, like check the code that you are actually pasting in your style sheet. I think it's, it's really obvious. Like for example, if you are using CSS free Pi to enable CSS free in Internet Explorer, um, then uh, if you're like trying to apply a gradient to some element on your website, um, and you, for example, used Colorzilla for gra gradient uh, generation, uh, so you just copy and paste that code and you're happy. And it's not working. Why isn't it working? Because Colorzilla used filters for uh, defining gradients. And if uh, you use filters along with CSS free Pi, it won't work. But you wouldn't know if you don't read the documentation and if you don't check uh, the code that you are actually pasting into your style sheet. So um, you should like be really extra careful about the, uh, the code that you are using um, and pasting just into your style sheet. Another thing is uh, CSS preprocessing. Um, 
basically what you have within a CSS preprocessor. You have, for example, mixins. Uh, you can like create all snippets of code and then include them in your style sheet. You can use variables, which actually will land probably not so soon, but uh, in the near future uh, in CSS anyway, because it's an editor's draft right now. Um, Basically, you need to write less, uh, and it's really easier to maintain uh, than pure CSS. So uh, you can also use uh, Compass, a uh, really great framework, along with SAS. So it's really easy to maintain uh, SAS and less files. It's really semantic also, because like I said, you can use variables. You don't need to like go through all of your code and then edit it like 20 times because you just changed something. I mean, you can do that like automatically, but in general, the idea is really great. And the next thing is the hype. Well, we all know about the hype. Like, remember the time when HTML5 and CSS3 surfaced? Like, we were like, yay, oh my god, it's so awesome. Like, let's use it right now. And I mean, it's really good. But um, you, you shouldn't be overexcited with these new technologies. I mean, they are really awesome, but you shouldn't be trying to stuck them in every project you're working on just because they are new and awesome, like, I don't know, CSS trans transforms or transitions. Like, you need to stop uh, overusing the school effects without reason. Yeah, or you can just use responsive HTML9 boiler strap, anyway. So yeah, so um, we have these tools we can use, but how we should approach the design or development processes anyway? Uh, we should ask the right questions, like how many of you are like, actually asking yourself, why am I using this tool? Is it like good for the job? Like, is anyone actually like asking themselves these questions in here? No? Yeah, okay, great. So you see, like, like 10 people maybe volunteered. Um, you should be like, um, I don't know whether you're um, working in huge companies or in startups. Are you working with specifications a lot? Like written specifications? No, not really? Okay. <laughs> but um, you should definitely uh, work out a process that you start with specifying the needs uh, from your project. Uh, like what are you actually trying to achieve? How are you going to achieve it? Like, and then you can make all of these decisions, like which framework is really good for me? Which library is really good? Like, should I go responsive or should I go with a native app? It can, it can apply to development and design. It's, it's very universal. So uh, you should just like sit and ask yourself those questions. Can I use something else? Uh, will it be good for the user? Will it be like good for maintainability? Will it be good for speed optimization? You should also remember that beautiful uh, won't equal usable. Like it more applies to design, but to development as well. Like heavy white designs are often not serving the purpose of the site, and they are making uh, the navigation for user really hard. So you should think about the uh, optimization and usability first, and then about the sugar coating your designs or development or code, whatever. Another important thing is simplicity. Want, uh, it doesn't mean minimalism. It's like everyone is thinking that simple equals minimal, and it's not true. Because you can get rid of the features and your website or app will be like really super clean and awesome, but it will be really hard to use. It will be really confusing for the user. So uh, minimal can be really hard to, like, to maintain and to use. So uh, you can even have like, really cluttered websites, but really easy to use. Like For example, can you check a Mason website and it's like, really cluttered with some crazy stuff over there, but it's fairly easy to use though. So the thing to remember is to be user-centric. Like, you need to base all of your decisions on that. Because like, being user-centric, thinking about the end user, and also thinking about your team, because most of you probably are working on a teams. So you need to think how to organize your code in a way that someone will dive easily in it and will, be like, will have no problems with it. So uh, using cutting edge features, uh, will not necessarily be so good for, for, for the projects you are working on. Um, and another thing is,
don't overdo it. It's like the basic rule and you should really remember that. Uh, for example, um, a lot of developers, uh, I saw that they're using JavaScript for really simple things, like for example, creating drop-down menus instead of uh, just using CSS. Why they are doing that? Are they like not familiar with the technology? Like, I don't know, do they really love jQuery and they just want to use it? I don't know. So you should be like starting off with these questions and then uh, remember about the user and keep in mind like the simple rule, the kiss rule, the don't repeat yourself rule and don't overdo it rule. And of course the thing about hypes. So if you want to use some cool technology with just surface like newest spec, okay, that's really fine. So do a crazy demo on, I don't know, on, and put it on GitHub, play, people will play around and I don't know, pull request that stuff, but keep it off your really like important projects. So I think that's all. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the slides will be up on speaker deck soon when I like restore my MacBook. And you can rate the talk also and speaker rate. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions.